From his office in the White House in Washington, the ABC television network presents an address by the President of the United States, John F. Kennedy. The President is to report on his trip to Europe, where he met with French President de Gaulle, Russian Premier Khrushchev, and the British Prime Minister Harold Macmillan. Ladies and gentlemen, the President of the United States. We returned this morning from a week-long trip to Europe, and I want to report to you on that trip in full. It was, in every sense, an unforgettable experience. The people of Paris, of Vienna, of London, were generous in their greeting. They were heartwarming in their hospitality, and their graciousness to my wife is particularly appreciated. We knew, of course, that the crowds and the shouts were meant in large measure for the country that we represented, which is regarded as the chief defender of freedom. Equally memorable was the pageantry of European history and their culture that is very much a part of any ceremonial reception. To lay a wreath at the Arc de Triomphe, to dine at Versailles and Schönbrunn Palace and with the Queen of England, these are the colorful memories that will remain with us for many years to come. Each of the three cities that we visited, Paris, Vienna, and London, have existed for many centuries. And each serves as a reminder that the Western civilization that we seek to preserve has flowered over many years and has defended itself over many centuries. But this was not a ceremonial trip. Two aims of American foreign policy, above all others, were the reason for the trip. The unity of the free world, whose strength is the security of us all, and the eventual achievement of a lasting peace. My trip was devoted to the advancement of these two aims. To strengthen the unity of the West, our journey opened in Paris and closed in London. My talks with General de Gaulle were profoundly encouraging to me. Certain differences in our attitude on one or another problem became insignificant in view of our common commitment to defend freedom. Our alliance, I believe, became more secure. The friendship of our nation, I hope, with theirs became firmer. And the relations between the two of us who bear responsibility became closer and I hope were marked by confidence. I found General de Gaulle far more interested in our frankly stating our position, whether or not it was his own, than in appearing to agree with him when we do not. For he knows full well the true meaning of an alliance. He is, after all, the only major leader of World War II who still occupies a position of great responsibility. His life has been one of unusual dedication. He is a man of extraordinary personal character, symbolizing the new strength and the historic grandeur of France. Throughout our discussions, he took the long view of France and the world at large. I found him a wise counselor for the future and an informative guide to the history that he has helped to make. Thus, we had a valuable meeting. I believe that certain doubts and suspicions that might have come up in a long time, I believe, were removed on both sides. Problems which proved to be not of substance, but of wording or procedure, were cleared away. No question, however sensitive, was avoided. No area of interest was ignored. And the conclusions that we reached will be important for the future in our agreement on defending Berlin, on working to improve the defenses of Europe, on aiding the economic and political independence of the underdeveloped world, including Latin America, on spurring European economic unity, on concluding successfully the conference at Laos, and on closer consultations and solidarity in the Western Alliance. General de Gaulle, could not have been more cordial, and I could not have more confidence in any man.